All right. Did I hit the record button? Okay, yeah. All right, let's get started. Um, I had an announcement slide that I had created, but for some reason it didn't upload it. Or hold on, it's sinking right here at the bottom. I don't know. I don't know why it didn't upload. I don't know. Um, I'll just wing it. So I had I, I had an issue the other day where I um, I had changed it at home and then it didn't. There, okay, there you go. See, I, it, it was wasn't fine. Now it's fine. Okay. All right. Sinking cloud stuff. All right, so we're rocking and rolling. Uh, 5.2 is being graded. My TA hasn't gotten through that yet, but 5.3 is due today. 5.4 is assigned today, and it is an Excel-based assignment. Um, and you'll understand the context of why that's going to be valuable today. But I'll tell you that the assignment is easier contextually than what we're doing in class. What we're doing in class today um, is for triangular loads. Here I have uniformly true the best type, but that should be triangular. There we go. Uh, today what we're going to do is we're going to look at shear and moment diagrams for triangular loads, and we're going to find that the graphical procedure works to develop qualitative shear and moment diagrams. But when we start getting into the quantitatives of it, we're going to see a problem, a pretty apparent problem. And computing the area under the curve is not something that's going to be done easily through just you know, graphical means. Um, but I've got a way around it where we don't need any calculus. Like calculus is, is a, is a non-issue with this. Okay, so let's dive in. Okay, so what we're looking at today is shear and moment diagrams for linearly distributed loads or triangular loads. Okay, and I use that term linearly distributed because I think you're going to see the next evolution, if you will, on our um, uh, relationship. Speaking of that, that relationship, we're still on the same pattern, the idea that the change in shear is equal to the magnitude of load, or if I want the shear, I integrate the load diagram, and then same thing between shear and moment. If I want the moment diagram, I need to integrate the shear diagram. Uh, and what, but again, we haven't really done the calculus, or we haven't taken any derivatives or taken any integrals. Now, we aren't going to take any derivatives or integrals today, but we're going to see a pattern that shows up. Um, and being able to take the derivatives or, uh, uh, and integrals, specifically the derivative, will serve as a nice little check that what we're doing is correct. Uh, and, and, and I don't want to delve too far into that. I kind of want to take our time and look at it. Now, so what we did last time is we had constant loads that led to linear shear diagrams and quadratic moment diagrams. Now we're going to have triangular loads. Triangular loads have a linear distribution. So that means the shear diagram is quadratic and the moment diagram is cubic. Okay, So that's going to create a problem when we start dealing with shear and moment diagrams for triangular loads because Using that graphical approach is going to kind of break down a little bit. It's not going to work. So we're going to have to figure out other ways to, to do this. We are going to then integrate the shear diagram, but again, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Now, last time, if you remember, I, I had a, a geometry problem. And I want to look at this geometry problem today. Um, I want to look at this one. Uh, let's see. Oh, it didn't see. Let's Let's... Let's add some related geometry to this. I swear it doesn't like sinking today. All right, so I have a geometry problem that I want to focus on. Okay, so here's a beam, and let's say the beam, I, I made up these numbers here to kind of make the, the, the point. Um, I have a beam that's subjected to a triangular load, and it goes, if the beam is 35 foot long, and uh, it goes from zero to four kips per foot, okay? Now, if you remember, we had a lecture a few, uh, 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 we had some slides a few lectures ago. I'm actually going to pull those slides up because I kind of want to relate to what we're talking about here. Let's go to lecture 16, and... We had 
this slide, okay? And what we had done is we had talked about cutting sections through distributed loads, right? And we said that, okay, here's a problem. And so if I wanted to compute reactions, I might idealize this as a 20 kip load, right? And then some moments to get this reaction is 65 kips, some forces in the vertical to get this reaction is 35 kips. But then what happens when I cut a section through an arbitrary point? Well, what happens is I redraw the free body diagram, but this isn't 20 kips, right? It's, it's now a new load at a new location. It's a 13 kip load at a location 3.25 uh, feet from A. Y'all remember that? The, the idea was that when we cut a section, we have a new free body diagram, new statics that we have to perform. And so in order to assess that, I want to now bring that up in the context of triangular loads. So let's say that I have a beam that's 35 foot long and I cut a section. But I don't cut a section at 20 feet from A or 15 feet from A. I cut a section X from A. Keep the distance variable, okay? Well, in order to determine the moments inside the section cut, what I'm gonna need to determine is this distance right here, and I'm going to need to determine the magnitude of the force, okay? And I'm going to need to do that as a function of x. So we got a little bit of alphabet soup we got to deal with. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, um, we're going to need to learn to embrace x. It's going to pop up. Shear is a function of x. Moment as a function of x. It's going to pop up. It's definitely going to pop up when we look at deflections because we're going to have to integrate moments. And needing and, and the ability to write moment functions is a critical skill. We're going to need to be able to do that. So let, let's take a look at this. Now, let's take a look at where did my pen go? There we go. Let's take a look at this triangular load. And again, let's say we've cut a section right here. Okay. So you know how it is, you cut a section, let's say you know you have a reaction right here and so on and so forth, and we want to determine the internal shear and the internal moment. So in order to do that, I need this magnitude and this distance. Let's start off with the distance. If this value is x and I keep this as a variable, what is that? What is my moment arm from the section cut? If this is x, what's that? If it's a triangular load, one third x. Okay, that's exactly right. All right, so there's one of them. D is x over three. Okay, now what about f? Okay, what is the magnitude of this load? Well, it's the area of the triangle, right? What is the area of the triangle? It is one-half base times height. Fair statement? So the base is x. But what about the height? I don't know what the height is yet. We haven't talked about that. But I propose that we can compute the height as a function of x. Would you agree with the following relationship? Would you agree that 4 is to 35 as h is to x? Think about that. 4 is to 35 as h is to x. So, h is 4x over 35. So this is 1 half x, 4x over 35. This is 2x squared over 35. That's a geometry problem that I threw at you before we even get into shear and moment land. Does that make sense? If I give you a triangle, 
and I give you the base and the height, and I say, okay, what is the area of this new triangle cut some distance away? It's just geometry and it's just algebra. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions on this? Because we're going to ramp it up a little bit. Okay. Let's ramp it up a little bit. All right. So, let me, for some reason, this didn't snip into my notebook. I don't know why. Here's going to be the problem that we assess. I have a beam with a triangular load on it. Let me snip this into the notebook. So here's our problem. We're going to draw the shear and moment diagram for this beam. We have a beam subjected to a triangular load. It should be pretty easy. Now, we've already talked before about the um, reality of triangular loads. Do we deal with triangular loads as engineers? Yes. And there are two contexts that come to mind. The first is hydrostatic effects. So we're talking about water pressures or even uh, lateral earth pressures on retaining walls and whatnot. So triangular loads are definitely something we deal with there. And also snow drifts on roof systems. So yes, we do. I'll level with you. I don't know if we deal with uh, um, vertical triangular loads that are up to 2,000 pounds per foot. Maybe on the lateral side, that's very possible. All right, now, like last time, I did not give you the reactions. So we're going to solve for those, okay? Before we solve for them, let's do what we have done. Take this distributed load, collapse it into a single point load, probably somewhere about right here. How much is that point load going to be? What's the magnitude of that point load going to be for this problem? If I take this triangular load and collapse it into a single concentrated load, is it 60? It's 30. Area of a triangle. So one half, two kips per foot times 30 feet is 30 kips. Don't forget that, that one half. There's a couple people I know on the exam that missed that on problem two, I think it was. That, 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 oh, that pesky one half. Don't forget that. Okay, so we got to collapse that into a, a, a point load there. How far is that from A? Make sure everybody's awake this morning. 10. From A? 20. From A? From B? 10. From A? 20. I think we're ready to sum some moments. So let's sum moments today. All right. So we're summing moments today. So I have 30 times 20 going like this. I can probably make that a little smaller. And that's going to be resisted by the reaction at B at a moment arm of 30 feet. So 600 foot kips is BY times 30, which means that BY is 20 kips upward. And so if BY is 20 kips upward, how much is AY? Simple, right? So I'm not even going to draw the table for that. So okay. So this okay. 
That's the simple part. That's easy. Right? Okay. Now let's get to the funky stuff. Let's draw the shear diagram. How's that work? Start at zero, and what do we do? What's the first thing we do? Go up ten. Go up ten. Okay. Now, something's going to happen between here to here between A and B. But between A and B, how much am I going to drop down? What's the total amount I'm going to drop down? If I'm at 10, how much am I going to drop? Well, ultimately 30 to negative 20, right? So, so I'm going to be at 10, and something's going to happen, and I'm going to be at negative 20, right? And then this reaction is going to take me upwards. Okay? So... Over here, I will be at, like over here, I'll be at negative 20. And then that reaction is going to take me back up to zero. But what's it look like in between? All right. So let's think about this in terms of slopes, right? We're integrating this to get that. So the slope here has got to equal that. Okay. So let's look right here at the negative 20. The load at negative 20 is this negative 2 kips per foot. So that means that the slope of this line has got to be like negative 2 right here. Right? What about at 10? How much load is right here? Nothing, right? No load, no slope. So if I track this out, does my shear diagram look something like that? What do you think? It's a parabola. Okay. This is quadratic. Now before we move on to the moment diagram, let me stop for a second and see if the shape of the shear diagram makes any sense. Is everybody okay with that? Now how do you draw the moment diagram? What do you do? We gotta find the area under the shear diagram. So that means we gotta find the area under this. Dang it. <laughs> That's hard, right? It's not simple triangles and rectangles now. This sucks, doesn't it? Now, here before we move on, before we just sort of give up, let's see what we can figure out. Okay? I do know that this area is positive, and I know that area is negative. There's no concentrated moments on the structure. There's nothing weird on the structure. So these two areas should equal one another. Okay? Now, this point right here is the point of zero shear. So what I can tell you So let me, let me drag this down a little bit. Oh, oh I didn't put the little tick marks.
So what I can tell you is I'm going to start at zero. I'm going to end at zero. And I'm going to go up to a value and then down to a value. So I'm going to have some maximum moment right here. And I can use the same analogy with the slopes, right? I better have zero slope right here, zero slope right here, negative slope here, positive slope here. So the moment diagram should look something about like that. And from a math perspective, it should be a cubic equation. But after that, I'm kind of lost because I don't have a simple graphical means of integrating this area to get some actual hard data. Enter the geometry problem we just did. What is the secret weapon of structural engineering? A samurai sword or a lightsaber if you happen to be a sci-fi fan. So let's do that. Let's see what happens. Let's go back to our original problem. Let's samurai sword or lightsaber that sucker. Through an arbitrary point. That arbitrary point meaning some distance x from here. Let's see what that looks like. Let's see what that looks like. So we're going to cut a section at X. And we'll say looking left. Here's the beam, there's the support. I have that reaction solved for, that was 10 kips, and I've got a triangular load. And there's where I Samurai sorted or lightsaber through the beam. Now, what I'm interested in finding right now is my unknown shear, which I'm drawing in the positive direction, and my unknown moment in the positive direction. These are not going to be numbers, they're going to be functions. V of x, m of x. So they're going to be functions. All right? And let's be clear, again, on terms of dimensions, this dimension is x. I'm going to move this just a little bit now. Like all triangular loads, I want to take that triangular load and I want to collapse that into a point load. So we're going to have some point load here, F. And then some moment arm. Can somebody tell me what the moment arm is? One third X. Exactly. This is one third X. X over three. The idea is that whatever this is, this is x over 3. But now we need f. All right? So let's go back to that problem we had before. So we have a triangle that this is 30 feet. 
This is two kips per foot. And what I want is what's going on with this little snippet of the triangle. This dimension is H, and this dimension is X. So 2 is to 30 as H is to X. So therefore, H is 2X over 30, or X over 15. So therefore, F is 1 half XH, 1 half X, X over 15, or F is X squared over 30. Take a step back. Did that go too fast? Does that make sense? So what I can do is I can replace this F. Here, I'll, I'll write this over here. I'll say F is X squared over 30. Any questions? Now, how do I determine V and M? This was homework 5.1. We just sum forces in the y direction, sum moments about the cut. So let's do that. So let's sum forces in the y direction. What do we get? So I got 10 up. What do I have going down? I have x squared over 30, and I have v going down. So 10, I'll just leave it as 10, and then x squared over 30 and v. So 10 equals x squared over 30 plus v, or v is 10 minus x squared over 30. Hmm. Interesting. Let's see some moments about the cut. See what happens there. So we've got this 10. Does that generate a moment about the cut? What is the moment arm? For this X so this way we have 10 X what about this does that generate moment okay it belongs over here what's the moment arm for this load right here X over 3 so we have x squared over 30. And then we have m. Hmm. What do we got? We got 10x equals, okay, what goes inside here? Okay, so we have x squared times x, x to the third over 90. plus m we've got that now I'm going to make a few observations about this here in a second but before we do I want to stop for a second see if everybody has any questions the shear function, what is the highest power of x in the shear function? 2. And if you have a function, a polynomial, and the highest power of x is 2, and we graph that, what do we get? The 
quadratic, right? Didn't we say that the shear diagram was going to be quadratic? What about for the moment? What did we say? Cubic? Highest power of x is a 3. Interesting. How about this? What is the derivative of this? What's the derivative of 10x? 10. What's the derivative of x cubed over 90? What's the derivative of x cubed? 3x squared. 3x squared over 90 is going to be x squared over 30. Maybe the derivative of this is that. Like I said, we're not going to need to compute these directly, but they do serve as a nice little check of one another. But that'll always happen, that the derivative of a moment is sheared. Now, you could integrate, but then there's that pesky little plus c. So you, that's why I like to differentiate. Uh, when I check, I like to differentiate versus integration. Break out some Excel. Let's look at some Excel. I like Excel. I'm an engineer. Of course, I like Excel. So I have here a little table. I made it kind of pretty, but you don't need to do that for you. If you want, what you could do is open up Excel. Here, I'll sort of do it over here on the side with you. And you could just say, create three columns. We'll call it X, B, and M. And what I'm going to do for the X column is I'm just going to go 0, 1, 2, and I'm going to go all the way to 30. Do you all remember the shortcut for that? You just highlight, grab the little corner with the black plus, and drag it all the way down to 30. See a lot of people brought their laptops. I like it. So what you do is, so you highlight that, and then place your mouse pointer to see how it turns black right here. And I just drag. Excel will automatically recognize that it happens. Does everybody kind of see that? All right, I want to make sure everybody's with me here at this point. Everybody's there. Now, what was the equation that we got for shear? What, 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 what did we just get? Hold on. 10 minus x squared over 30. 10 minus x squared over 30. So what I'm going to do is watch this. Everybody watch up here. So I'm going to say equals 10 minus and then that squared over 30. I just use the left arrow to get over. And watch this. So I hit enter. Everybody watch up here. All right, watch this. So all you got to do is fill in that first cell, take your mouse cursor, go to the bottom corner, double click. Boom. Fills in the rest of the table. Do these values look correct? I mean, it starts at 10. What does it go to? Negative 20? Watch this. Let's highlight both columns. So just highlight both columns and just go to insert. And what we're going to do is we're going to insert a scatter plot. And what I'm going to do is just, I like to insert the one that's just straight lines. Hmm. The 
does that look right? It looks right to me, right? Now, no self-respecting engineer is just going to leave their Excel plot looking like this. We've got to spiffy this up a little bit. We've got to, this isn't necessary for what we're talking about in class, but I mean, come on. So we're going to right click on that X axis. We're going to format the X axis so that it goes from 0 to 30. We're going to take the labels, put them low so that they're not in the way of the graph. Go with me on that. All right. Let's change the labels. It's called the chart title the shear diagram. Let's insert some axis titles. We'll say distance across beam. That's X in feet. We'll say this is shear and kips. Now we're starting to get a shear diagram that looks a little bit more respectable, don't you think? I'm putting y'all to work this morning. This part isn't like completely necessary for what we're doing in class today, although I do want a relatively neatly formatted plot for your homework. So. Alright, any questions on the formatting? Or is everybody able to do that? Do you want me to stick around on this for a sec or move on? You tell me. I'm happy to go through some of the axis formatting and the label formatting right now. We have to Everybody good, or you tell me? All right. What was the, now let me move this graph off, off the side. I'm just going to grab it on the bottom left corner and move it over here. What was the expression for moment? What was it? Um, 10x minus x cubed over 90. All right, so equals 10 times that first column minus that first column cubed over 90, enter, then move my mouse over to that bottom right corner and double click. Is that passing the smell test? Well, we start at zero, we end at zero. Now, I want everybody to watch this up here, everybody eyes up here. So watch this. Personally, I'm lazy. I would rather not make the same graph twice. So watch this. I'm going to click the graph as a whole, copy, and paste. So now I have a duplicate of that graph. And then whenever you click the graph, see how the columns highlight over here on the left? Just take that first column, drag it over, and by golly gosh, gee, now we're printing the moment diagram. The only thing we have left to do is just change the labels up. Change that label there. Boom. Move these sort of where they're in line. Okay. Yes? Uh, could you shut the formula for your phone again? I'll do you one better.
You have to choose the curves on the same plot. Yeah. But you can what you can do is just copy the chart and just delete them. All right, let me go back to my plots here and see where you all are at. You all should have something that looks about like this. Does everybody have that? Now, let's make some observations. First off, do they qualitatively look like they're supposed to? The shapes, generally. Well, yes. Second observation. I've lined these graphs up. Notice that the point of zero shear coincides with the point of maximum momentum that they line up. We also can figure out about how much that moment is. It's about like 115, 116. We're going to compute that exactly here in a second. But what is probably most surprising to students first learning this concept is look at where zero shear is. Where is it? From zero. What is that, about 17 feet? And some students are like, wait a minute, shouldn't it be 20? Like, shouldn't it be two-thirds of the way over? Not necessarily. Because we're not asking where the centroid is. We're asking where that parabola crosses the x-axis. It's not necessarily in the same spot. Okay? But how do I find this value exactly? How do I compute that exactly? Well, this value occurs where this is zero. So let's go back to the calculations. So if I want to go back to the calculations, how about this? Find Let me move this over. Oh, I'm close to the mean to. So let's find the point where shear equals zero. So zero equals ten minus x squared over thirty. 10 equals x squared over 30, 300 equals x squared. x is the square root of 300. What is the square root of 300? Seventeen point three two. Seventeen point thirty two feet. Normally, I would ask for a second, but by golly gosh, gee, isn't that what my plot is doing for me? Doesn't the shear cross zero at about 17.32 feet? And if I want to find what the maximum moment is, I say, okay, so... maximum moment, m of x is 10x minus x cubed over 90, so therefore m max is m at 17.32 feet, which is 10 times 17.32 minus 17.32 cubed over 90. What is in max? We'll say to the nearest one decimal place. Keep it simple.
115.5. Right? And again, I would ask for a second, but isn't my graph doing that for me? Don't I achieve a maximum moment at around 115? By golly gosh gee, look at that. It's craziness, isn't it? Any questions on that? That's it, one of the things I really always appreciated about structural analysis is it sort of beautifully serves as a self-correct, like it corrects itself. Everything comes together at the end. Like the answer, the answers all match. They all reference one another. There's a, a, a mathematical I don't know, beauty to it, I don't know. Okay, I want to show you real quick your homework tonight. Your homework is this. I want you to develop a spreadsheet for that. I have a simply supported beam subjected to a uniformly distributed load. I want a plot of the shear diagram and the moment diagram in Excel, okay? Label the axes, put a title on the plots, um, submit it as a single spreadsheet. If you want, you can include calculations. You can just scan uh, images directly in the spreadsheet, or you can submit it as a separate PDF and Blackboard, however you want to do it. That's fine. Um, but that's what I want. I want a spreadsheet for that. And again, this is going to be easier. This is not a triangular load. I want to be absolutely crystal clear about that because I want everybody to listen. You know how those moment arms were x over 3? That's not going to work. That's not a triangle. That's a rectangle. So pay attention. 1 half bh, that's not going to work. This isn't a triangle. This is a rectangle. But this is easier. Any questions? I'm pulling up the code again. That's all I got. I will see you all Friday.